So what we're going to be doing today is we're going to uh, take a look at uh, how to deal with questions. So more uh, prepping for uh, the URC. And uh, I just thought that I would give you a heads up. So this is hot off the press, not officially published yet, but um, we have organized the presentations uh, into different panels. Once again, um, the challenge was for our psychology panels to determine uh, which ones will go together out of, uh, you know, which dimension are we going to group them on. So that task actually fell to me. So I hope I did. I did the best that I could. So we'll take a look at uh, who is presenting where. So again, this is tentative. It's like 99% uh, um, though, this is what the sessions are going to be. All right. So, okay. So we got, uh, they're all the psychology of the first one had to do with, uh, was grouped around the idea of perception. So we got the psychology of uh, the perception of abuse, aesthetics and dogs. So we got Calista with the effects of motor mimicry on victim blaming. That moves into uh, Landry's work, popularity and abuse of female comic book characters. That goes into, that links nicely to Davis, complex choices and why you won't like them. And then rounding it out, we have uh, Cassie with the canine training method, methods. So this is all kind of grouped around the idea of perception. So that's going to be uh, one of the sessions. The other session, we got the psychology of social media and mood on behavior. So Hannah will be in this one, the effect of mood on cognitive functions, uh, localizing prefrontal cortex. And then uh, Lex with uh, lack of physical communication and connection to male suicide. And then Alyssa, how social media impacts uh, women's self-esteem. And then Mora with cell phone use around the world is contributing to cognitive decline. So just the idea of um, the effect of mood and this kind of like social media that we are um, being bombarded with. And then the last panel, uh, unfortunately, we had to, for some of these panels, we had to group five uh, talks together. So I really wanted to give a heads up to this last panel. You'll have 12 minutes in total for your presentation. What that means is that you'll have 12 minutes for your presentation and some questions. So just bear that in mind when you're rehearsing. Um, you're, it's going to be a little bit shorter. But we got Mark with our political. So this one is around kind of like hot button social issues, politics, race, and sexual orientation. So we got our political news articles stressing us out uh, from Mark. We got Megan with the development of political attitudes. Sandra, political affiliation and word usage. And then we go into Ben's the effect of attire on perception. And then finish it off with Taylor, conformity, church, church beliefs, predictors of Christian attitudes towards gay and lesbian people. So those are going to be the sessions. Those are the sessions that you're in. And uh, as I said, for this session here, there was no other way around it. We had to put five into a, a single session. So just bear that in mind. You'll have uh, approximately 12 minutes uh, per. While we're on that subject, um, as we mentioned before, you really, really want to make sure that you are uh, telling your story and uh, telling a good story. And uh, one thing to remember about a uh, or to know about a conference, unlike maybe an assignment where you're getting present, uh, where you're getting um, uh, you know, graded on a presentation, your conference presentation does not need to be a certain length. It can be up to that length and below. So don't at all think that you need to go the full 12 minutes. If your presentation works as a 10 minute presentation, that's fine. You'll have more time for, uh, for questions. Uh, moderators, I'll let you in on a little secret. Moderators, the ones that have to um, keep the panel uh, in time, they love the short presentations because it is always a struggle to get people to finish. I don't know how many presentations I've gone to where that little you know two minutes left warning sign went up and they're like, oh, I still have like 40 slides to go. And then they're just like, let's just do, 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 you know, zoom through all these. Um, I have oftentimes come in under time and I can see the smile on the moderator's face where they're like, oh, well, we're done. Right. So awesome. So don't feel you got to go. You know, if you're in one of the four presenter panels, you got 12 minutes for your presentation. That leaves three minutes for questions. 
if you're in the five presenter panel, you got about 10 minutes for the presentation. That'll leave two minutes for questions. But don't feel like you have to pad out your uh, your presentation uh, if if you know just to meet that time. So if you go under, you know, if it only takes you 10 minutes, you know, uh, in the 15 minute sessions, if it only takes you eight minutes or whatever, focus on doing a good presentation. Don't worry about how long uh, it goes. And once again, it's just that idea of putting together a good story. So uh, think about. Um, Think about those uh, those TV shows that used to have an overarching um, storyline and how wonderful they were at the beginning before people knew they were going to be a hit. So the one that comes to my mind is Lost. Lost at the beginning, it was tight. It was uh, They would reveal secrets at a, at a nice rate. And then somewhere around the end of the second season, they, re they realized that it was a juggernaut of a show. It was just this massive, massive hit. So then they said, hey, you know that two seasons of stories we have left? Let's stretch it out. Yeah, over seven seasons or however long they lasted. And you were watching it. It was like homework. And you're sitting there going, this story should not be this long. It's not this long. Why am I watching 12 episodes when three would have covered the story? Same thing with your presentations. They're going to be as long as they need to be. right? So do your story. Do it well. You don't have to pad it. I'm not going to be sitting there with a timer and grading you and saying, oh, you went under 10 minutes. That's, you know, can't uh, give you full marks for that. You get full marks for covering the intro, the methods, the results in the discussion. You get full marks for using the presentations correctly, for doing, you know, for uh, doing your PowerPoint correctly, using your images, making, you know, choosing your one to two take home points. You get points for all that. I will not be timing you other than to say, you got two minutes left, wrap it up. Time is up, you know, we'll do some questions. So bear that in mind. If you need to go a little bit under, that is completely fine. Uh, any questions on the URC before we uh, take a look at our dealing with questions, how to for today? Yep. So are the moderators listed? Uh, like, is it going to be you, like Dr. Risk, and whoever else is included on there? Yep. So you'll see the moderators. Um, basically, I'll be moderating the three panels that we'll be in. And uh, so, you know, I will have this little things that say, you know, two minutes left and whatever. You will have your time. Um, and uh, there will be judges in there because typically uh, you're not allowed to judge the work that you sponsored. Um, so there will be other faculty there uh, to kind of um, uh, judge the, you know, the honorable mentions and the best presentation. Mm -hmm. So is that the order that the panels are going in, or do we not know that yet? That is typically the order that the panels go in, but I am open to suggestions. Uh, I put them in that order because that just seemed to be a nice connected flow where like one kind of touched on what oh. the next panel will do. But that's typ typically they yeah. will be in the order that, they, that they're listed on. Yeah, and I just meant that you talked about our group going last, so are we going in the afternoon as opposed to Yes, oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. So there are three separate sessions. Uh, I believe there's two in the morning, then a lunch break, and then a third session. So we have one of one of those was in the morning, early session. One of them was in the morning, late session. And then one of them was going to be in the afternoon session. The five presentation, psychology of politics, race, and orientation, that's in the afternoon. That's going to be at 1.30. Gotcha. Yep. And then uh, I also heard um, that there are interviews, I think, for um, social work happening on that same day as the undergraduate research conference. So if for any reason something comes up and you can't make it to the undergraduate research conference, we can schedule in a makeup presentation because you still have to present for the, um, uh, you know, for the class. But if you can't make it on that day to the undergraduate research conference, it's, it's highly unfortunate, but uh, it won't affect your grade. You'll miss the opportunity to let people know about your, uh, your research. But it happens in a uh, in a conference that sometimes people miss their connecting flights. People uh, just can't make it, um, you know, to the conference for whatever, and then their um, uh, their spot in the panel just kind of disappears, and you have a little bit of extra time for questions and stuff. All right. So, anything else about the URC? Okay. So, dealing with questions, we're gonna, we're going to cover that today. 
And uh, we're going to once. Oh, sorry. Yep. Mine isn't about the DRC, but just something I was wondering. You know how for uh, the introduction and the sections we have those peer review things where we fill out what we changed. Are there, mm -hmm. is there going to be one for the, the results and discussion? Because yep. I haven't seen it posted on Canvas yet. I think it, it should. I think I did it either yesterday. I think I did it yesterday. It should be up there. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, no, it was, um, yeah, I, I put a, I put a few things on my uh, up on my day, including the assignment tab where you can hand all the uh, hand in your final uh, draft of the research. And if you saw the announcement, two reviews have been assigned for the um, for the research paper, and just I mean the deadline was uh, midnight uh, last night, but just to give everybody a chance in case you're coming in late. Um, the peer reviews are going to be assigned by midnight tonight. So if you still haven't been able to uh, hand in your draft, please do that as soon as you can. If you can do it before Monday tonight, it'll get spread out into that peer review. And then you won't have to worry about, oh, I didn't get assigned a peer review or people aren't peer reviewing my, um, uh, my assignment. All right. So conference talk presentation. Let's get ready for that, uh, uh, for the URC coming up. So once again, presentation guidelines, we'll talk about the alpha guideline and the beta guideline, the two big guidelines that you should be thinking about. And then we're going to take a look at questions and we'll take a look at uh, steps uh, to answering questions. What's a good uh, kind of procedure for when you're answering questions? And then very importantly, what to do if you can't think of an answer. So I don't think anybody up here is concerned with being asked a question that they know the answer to. Right? I don't think anybody's concerned with somebody raising their hand and saying, how many subjects did you run? Right, where you would be like, oh, you know, nobody's worried about that. But you're always a little bit concerned about what to do if you can't think of an answer. So we'll specifically talk about strategies if you find yourself in that situation. We'll talk about nice ways to give an answer because sometimes, it happens rarely, but sometimes, you know, questioning can seem to get a little bit heated. So you definitely want to defuse any situations. And it's just a nice way to keep it all polite and, um, above board at a conference. And then we're going to talk about nice versus mean questions and basically how to deal with those uh, mean questions. So how do you identify them and then how do you deal with them? All right, so remember, 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 we've already touched on it today. That's how important it is. Remember your alpha guideline. Uh, during a presentation, you are telling a story. You are telling a story. It's a story based on science. It's a story based on truth, but it is nevertheless a story. So do your presentation in that manner, in that manner of telling them a story where they will take home, they will remember one or two very, very important things. And remember that you're telling this story and you're telling it to human beings. So it matters how you tell them, right? A well put together story is gonna go into somebody's mind and stay there way better than one that is very scattered. So take into account the fact that we're dealing with human beings that like simple structure, that like nice pictures, uh, that like things presented in a, in a logical flow that'll take them from the beginning all the way to the end. And then especially important for uh, today, remember, 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 you are under no obligation to answer the question that you were asked. And this is something, again, that is very different than our societal rules, right? In society, we sort of feel obligated to answer questions that were asked, right? When somebody says, hey, how are you? We kind of feel obligated to give that response and say, oh yeah, we're doing fine. Um, but in a conference, in a presentation, remember you are under no obligation whatsoever to answer the question that you were asked. Um, we are going to deal with questions, but just keep that in the back of your mind. You do not, you're not uh, required the way that you are in society. To actually answer what you what they asked. Mm -hmm. How can you do that respectfully? We are going to get to those. So we have a few strategies where you can attain this goal. But it's important to remember this in your mind. It's very freeing when you realize that you can use strategies to deflect questions rather than having to deal with them straight up. All right. So just to give you an example. And this was uh, Lauren Leonard uh, at uh, the URC, I believe, two years ago. And she did work on stereotypes uh, in autistic children. So you can see here, this is on my YouTube channel. Um, you can see here, this is uh, midway during the presentation. So this is midway during the presentation. 
And you can see she's very serious. She's, you know, doing her presentation. She's doing a great job. And then this is right at the end. And you can tell this is question session, right? This is the question time. And you can look at her, all right? Zoom in on that. Look at that face right there. <laughs> happy to answer questions. No fear, no worrying, engaged and happy to answer questions. So this is where we want to get you to. The question period is oftentimes the best part of the entire presentation because you get to engage with your peers at a conference. You get to engage with your professionals. A lot of times the best ideas I have for future research come from people in the presentation saying, did you think about this? Have you looked at this? You know, I read about this. So we want to make sure that you get to that point where you can enjoy that, where you can say, sit there and, or stand there and say, you know what, I can handle anything that comes my way. And that'll kind of free you up to have this kind of experience where you're enjoying yourself during a question session. So how do we get there? Let's start that up right now. So answering a question. Steps to answering a question. And you want to follow this every single time. Number one, listen to the whole question. So when somebody starts talking, when somebody starts asking a question, typically just stand there. Just stand there, look at them, listen to what they're saying. You know, you can nod your head, but you want to listen to the entire question. Don't interrupt them. Don't kind of try to guess at what they're asking about. Listen to that entire question. Uh, don't interrupt. And then once you, this kind of seems uh, straightforward, but, and it is. Once you hear the, uh, get the question, think of your answer, and then you just tell them the answer. So simple as one, two, three. Those are the three steps to answering a question. So this is for questions that you know the answer to, right? This one is very important. Listen to that whole question, right? Let them finish. And then you can stand there for a bit and think of that answer. And then you just go ahead and you tell them the answer. All right, but what if you can't think of that answer? What if you're sitting here at number two and nothing is coming to mind, right? Or what if you're sitting here at number two and you know for a fact that you have no idea what that answer should be? So what can we do? Well, the strategies all go back to that idea that you are under no obligation to answer this question. So what can we do? A uh, couple of strategies. Strategy number one, you can pause and think. Sometimes it will come, all right? Sometimes you'll be sitting there and you won't quite have the answer. And then all of a sudden you'll be like, oh, okay, now I have the answer. In our society, for some reason, we have been fooled into thinking that some sort of speed in answering is indicative of intelligence. The psychology has told us the complete opposite. In psychological studies, they have found that silence actually makes you look more intelligent. Um, sitting there and thinking about things makes you feel more intelligent. So if somebody asks you a question, feel free to just sit there and think about it. So if somebody's like, oh, what do you think the implications of this would be for children in elementary school? It is completely fine, and you will seem more intelligent for it if you're just sitting there going, oh, that's a very interesting question. You can do the hand gestures if you like to. <laughs> but, I mean, just stand there and think about it. Don't feel like the clock is ticking, like it's Jeopardy countdown, and you need to, like, get your answer out. Think about it and answer for a second. It'll make you look uh, more intelligent, and you might actually come up with the correct answer. So you can just sit there and go, hmm. What do you think about that? Yeah. Yeah. You can do whatever, but you can take your time. Don't feel like you got to get an answer out. Mm -hmm. Is there like an amount of time that once you hit a certain mark, you're no longer seeming intelligent enough to speak? I would say so. I would say if you got three minutes, don't try to run out the clock. But definitely, I mean, we 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 have that tendency to think that you know if we're not if it's not there in like a second. They're going to think we're, you know, we're, we don't know what we're talking about or, or we're going to be seen somehow as, as less intelligent, less capable. But it's the opposite is true. So um, you can you can stand there for longer than you think. Right. And you'll still you, you'll still come across as an intelligent uh, thinking individual. Right. So, again, it's that it's that idea of if you ask somebody and they, they pause and they're silent, we perceive them as going into deep thinking. We perceive them as highly intelligent. And that's a strategy because when you're stuck at number two, if you know, oh, I can take 20 seconds and just stand here, 
that will relax you and you might actually come up with the answer, right? And sometimes it does take 20 seconds. I remember in our discussion uh, when Taylor, when you had the results that were, um, that were the counterintuitive results, right? You didn't come up with your implication or your conclusion right away. It took you 20 seconds. If that happens in your, in your presentation, you can just sit there and be like, oh, let me think. Oh, 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 yeah, I get it. You know, so feel free, take a pause, sit there, do your hand gestures, you know, mm, a little bit, and you'll actually come across as more intelligent. Don't worry about appearing incompetent. Um, you'll actually appear more competent if you take some time. And you might actually want to do this with things that you actually know, right? Give that a shot. So if somebody asks you a question and you're like, oh my gosh, I know that answer. Sit there and be like, all right, let me, hmm, let me think about that. Yeah, what it is. I'll just take a couple of seconds. You know, feel free to use that strategy as well. All right, strategy number two that you can do. So you listen to the whole question. You're trying to think of an answer. You can't think of an answer. Uh, what you can do is you can buy yourself some more time. You can ask them to restate the question. So you can simply uh, say things like, oh, you know, can you, can you restate that question? Uh, you can ask them to provide an example. So you'd be like, oh, can you know, could you possibly give me an example of what you uh, what you mean? So you can say things like, you know, oh, I'm not, I, I'm not sure if I understand what you're asking. Um, you know, could you ask it in another way? Uh, you could say things like, you know, could you give me an example of of what you mean by that? So once again, if um, you know they they had their hand up and they were like, do you think that the stereotype the stereotypes and autistic children uh, would follow them throughout their lifestyle, uh, throughout their lifespan, or will they, you know, establish themselves in early uh, childhood but then disappear by late adolescence? I could ask him. I'm not sure. Uh, I understand what you're asking. Are you asking about developmental trajectories, or are you asking about personality traits? Uh, which one of those two are you asking about? Or you could say, you know, could you give me an example, like a uh, autistic stereotypey? What, what, what do you, you know, could you give me an example of those? Either of those kind of throws it back to them and it will either clarify the question because you might actually be confused. Like, I'm not entirely sure what you want to ask. So these are nice ways of saying, you know, can you rephrase that? Can you give me an example? And then what that also does is it throws it back onto the person that asked the question and once again, gives you a little bit extra time and extra clarification to answer that uh, that question. All right, so bear that in mind as well. Strategy number three, uh, you can ask them a question about their question. So one of the things about a conference uh, question period is that oftentimes it's more like a conversation than a press conference, right? It's more like a, you know, this is, you know, what do you think? Oh, well, what do you think? Oh yeah, this is what I think based on what you think. Oh, let's, you know, let's continue this conversation. So you can ask them a question about the question. You can ask them things like, oh, are you asking about, um, you know, this aspect of it? Um, you know, what do you mean by, uh, by metaphor? So I, I know when, um, when I'm in, uh, presenting on visual metaphor, different people have different definitions of metaphor. It's one of the issues in the field that we can't really agree upon. This is what classifies things as a metaphor versus, you know, not a metaphor. So sometimes I might ask them, you know, if they say, oh, you know, what do you think is the implications of your literal versus metaphorical theory? Doesn't that contradict what so-and-so said? I might ask them, well, can you provide me what is so-and-so considered to be a metaphor? You know, what, what is your definition of a metaphor? And, uh, you know, are you asking about the difference between this aspect of literal versus metaphorical? Or are you asking about the difference between how we process it or how we classify it? So you can always throw the question back to them by asking for clarification, uh, asking if, you know, what is the difference that you're looking for? Because sometimes the question itself will be a little bit ambiguous and it's just a good practice to be like, let me clarify what you're looking for. And again, buys you that time if you can't think of an answer uh, and it gives you something else, you know, to talk about. So are you asking about the difference between this and this? Is that what you're asking? Or is it the difference between these other two things, or is it some other aspect? Um, are you acting, asking about the impact of social media, or are you asking about the development of social media? Which one of those, you know, is your question pertaining to? So that's another question, a strategy. You can ask them a question about their question. Strategy number four, you can answer your own question. 
So strategy number four is the final strategy in the what if you can't think of an answer to a question. And this is where you completely take advantage of that beta guideline and you just uh, answer whatever question you want to answer. So the phrase that you can use is the phrase uh, that uh, whatever they ask relates to a more fundamental issue that you have to deal with first, right? So if you just simply say, oh, that's a very interesting question. That does relate to a more fundamental issue, which, you know, we need to address first. And that is the issue of whatever. So if I was asked, you know, um, about, again, uh, because Lauren did it in her presentation about stereotypes. If I was asked about stereotypes and their impact on the cognitive development of, you know, uh, children, and I had no idea about any of that, I could say, well, that's a very interesting question. This actually relates to a more fund uh, fundamental issue, which is how do we categorize things? Do we categorize them metaphorically or literal? And uh, let me tell you all about metaphors that I know, right, that I'm an expert in. Uh, and then that's the way to get out of that question. So this is the ultimate one where you just deflect the question and you say, oh, okay, that was a very interesting question. It relates to a more fundamental issue of whatever it is that I feel comfortable talking about at this particular moment. And you can always drive it in that direction. So again, you, you uh, acknowledge the question, but you then use this phrase to say, all right, I'm gonna take your question. I'm gonna say it relates to this more fundamental issue. And then I'm going to talk about this for the next, you know, 30 seconds to 60 seconds. Uh, and that's the way to get out of it. So you can say that relates to a more fundamental issue. Uh, you can say that ties into this very related issue. You know, so if somebody uh, asks you, well, you know, what is the difference between this, this category and this category? And you have no idea, right? It's in your own experiment. And let's just say you're blanking on the difference between the levels of your independent variable. You can always say, oh, well, that ties into this related issue of, you know, what it was that we were asking our subjects to do in the survey. And specifically, this survey was made to measure their differences in their attitudes. And part of the survey was this, part of the survey was that. And you just get out of answering that question. Uh, and that's when you really just know that you're not going to be able to get that answer. So... Keep this one in mind. This one has saved me a few times. And again, this is the idea that you have to override your programming. You do not need to answer the question that was asked. And this literally says, oh, here's the question you asked, but that relates to whatever question I want to answer. So now I'm going to answer that question. All right. So any questions about those four strategies? What was the third one again? Third one was ask them a question about their question. So go over these strategies, try them out. Uh, everybody here will probably have a good idea of one or two questions that they are hoping will not get asked, right? So everybody kind of knows their strengths and their weaknesses in terms of their knowledge base. Uh, everybody knows that you never want a question out of your, you know, out of your weaknesses. So think about those questions. Think about what is, you know, the, the trickiest question. What is the one that you're most concerned about? And then try these three strategies. Try to think about what would you, you know, what kind of, um, what would you do if, if you asked them uh, about, uh, you know, providing another example or restating that question? How would you go through that? What about a question about that question? You know, so for some sort of clarification. And then try this one. Try the deflection into something that you know very, very well. And I guarantee you this one you can always, always use. You can always say, very interesting question, ties into this other uh, fundamental issue, which we have to get clear on before we can even come back to your question. And then you get clear on the issue and you're done. And half of the time they won't even realize that you never even addressed their initial question. So you can get out of it. It's your nuclear option, but it's there. It's always there. All right, any other questions about those strategies? Okay. So the next thing I want to equip you with are nice ways to tell uh, tell somebody an answer. So again, especially when a conference gets heated, um, think you know you want you want to have ways of diffusing the tension. You really want to make sure that the conference kind of stays a friendly you know open exchange uh, of ideas. And um, 
this, uh, this first strategy, um, you know, you might think to yourself, well, we're scientists, you know, we shouldn't fall for this. Uh, but remember, we're human beings. I mean, this is a story being told to human beings. So one of the first things you can actually use is flattery. Flattery is always a very nice way to start answering the question. And I'm not talking about going to somebody and saying, you know what, you are gorgeous. Thank you for asking that question. <laughs> but you can say stuff like, oh, that's a really good question. And this is code for you saying, you're smart. Like You are a smart person, right? So that's a really good question. Uh, well, you know, and think about the opposite. Think about how you would feel if you asked a question and somebody said, that's a dumb question. But I'll <laughs> answer it anyway, right? So that's a really good question. It's flattery. And it immediately kind of diffuses, you know, the situation. If Even if there's not a situation, it just makes it for a much friendlier experience. So if you've seen um, Incredibles 2, if you've seen Incredibles 2, anybody? This is just me? Okay. So if you've seen Incredibles 2, you remember the scene at the end after they've uh, captured the screen slaver and uh, Violet was talking about, you know, the, um, the main character, one of the... The brother was like, oh my, she's going to go to jail. And Violet is like, well, I'm sorry that she's incredibly rich. and She'll probably only get a slap on the wrist. Remember how he addressed her question? He walked up, walked up to her and he goes, Violet, I like you. Right? Just right off the bat, let me defuse this situation. I like you. A little bit of flattery. That's always a nice way to do it. So when somebody asks a question, even if it's not, you can start off your answer with be like, hey, you know what? That's a really good question. Hey, you know what? I never thought of that. Wow, thanks for asking. Uh, you know, oh, that's a very interesting way of thinking about that. You know, that's an interesting example that you've just given. That's a nice way to kind of get them on board, uh, get them on your side uh, so that you can <laughs> layer strategies. So you can be like, you know what? That's a really good question. And uh, it relates to this more fundamental issue. So let me walk away with what I want to talk about having diffused that situation. All right, strategy number two. Um, this is what I like to call thanks for the contribution. So this is another way of kind of just making it a very friendly, open exchange of ideas. And you're basically thanking them for that contribution. So if you start off the question with, oh, I never would have thought of asking that, or I never would have thought of, you know, linking those two ideas, or I never would have thought of applying this research to the elderly. Um, that's your way of saying, you know what, you've just given me a great idea. Thanks so much for the contribution. Um, so you can start it off and be like, oh, I never thought of that. That never occurred to me. Oh, what a great suggestion. And that's strategy number two. That's your uh, thanks for the contribution type uh, question or dealing with questions. All right. So those are the nice ways uh, to tell them the answer. And uh, you're not going to get the other thing is you're not going to get very many questions. So in a three minute question period, you're really limiting yourself to a maximum like three questions. So don't think that you're going to run out of strategies dealing with them. Um, you know, you're going to be able to answer most of them. You'll probably, in all honesty, be able to answer all three. But this is, again, just stuff that you have in your back pocket in case things go south. You got these different strategies. But you can definitely use these two every single time. So even if you know the answer, you know, say, oh, you know what? That was a really good question. Uh, you know, you know the answer. Oh, wow. Never would have thought of that. You know, thanks for bringing that up. Uh, it makes me think about this, blah, blah, blah. And off you go. All right. So moving on next issue, nice versus mean question. So one of the kind of key skills that you'll develop, the more presentations you go to is the ability to very quickly identify what is a nice question and what is a mean question? And nice questions aren't necessarily softball questions. Uh, and mean questions aren't necessarily just very, very tough questions. They differ fundamentally in the sense that some questions are nice because they're answerable. So if somebody says, you know what, tell me about your, your survey that you used. You can tell them about the survey that you used. If somebody says, oh, tell me about uh, the results um, that you got for the first condition, right? Tell me about the statistics test that you used. These are all questions that you have the answer to. More importantly, these are questions that can be answered. 
And that's what makes them a nice question. They're a question that actually has an answer to them. So things like tell me about your, you know, tell me about your research, tell me about your conclusions. Uh, one of my favorites, what do you think about? And then whatever, you know, they, they bring up. So, you know, based on your research, what do you think about the current rise in the use of uh, Instagram and people leaving Facebook? Based on your research, uh, what do you think about the, uh, you know, the decline of education in the United States? Based on your research, what do you think about this? Those are really nice questions because they're literally saying, listen, you're the expert. Uh, I'm, I'm interested in what you have to say. I'm interested in your insight. And they're literally saying, like, speculate. You know, we know you haven't done the research on this, but what, what do you think about, you know, uh, the reaction of people to this particular instance in the news or whatever? So um, those are the nice questions. They have answers to them. That's what makes them nice. Some questions are not so nice. These are the mean questions. So mean questions would be something like, well, how do you know the BDI actually measures depression? So imagine you do your study on depression and you measure depression with the best depression inventory and you use that to split your, your subjects into two different groups and everything is based on that. Everything is based on the fact that you were able to split your subjects into two groups and along comes somebody and asks a mean question that says, well, how do you actually know that the best depression inventory is measuring depression? Maybe it's just measuring anxiety. Maybe it's just measuring people's willingness to fake that they have depression. How do you know that they're measuring depression? And this is a mean question for two reasons. Number one, it's very difficult to know. People have dedicated years of research trying to establish whether the Beck's depression inventory actually measures depression. And the way that you can know that it's, uh, we're still not sure is the fact that there are like 10 different established measures of depression. If Beck's depression inventory absolutely measured depression, we would have one system of measurement, Beck's depression inventory. There's at least 10 different surveys, different scales. So this is a mean question because number one, you can't answer it. Number two, it cuts to the heart of your entire study. It kind of pulls the rug out from your entire study. Um, this one. Mean question. How do you know the subjects actually read the instructions? This is going to be especially important for anybody that does this, did their studies online. Because once again, you have no idea and there's no way to tell, right? How do you know the subjects read the instructions? I don't, I don't know, right? There's no answer to that. Um, for people doing face to face, how do you know your subjects followed your instructions? I don't know, they could, they, I told them to, right? But there's no way to know that uh, for sure. Another one here, um, give you an example. Is there a chance that your results would change if more subjects were tested? Yeah, there's a chance. Maybe they would, maybe they wouldn't. I don't know, right? I tested 20, if I test 40, who knows? Who knows what's gonna happen? So if you have a significant result, this would be a mean question because they're basically saying, hey, you got a significant result. Maybe it's only because you ran 20 subjects. Maybe it's only because you ran 30 subjects. Maybe it's only because you ran can be put ahead of any number of subjects. So you could literally say, well, maybe you only, you know, it's only because you ran 500 subjects. That's the reason you got the results. Maybe if you ran more, your results would reverse. Yeah, maybe, I don't know. There's no way of knowing it. Cuts to the heart of your, uh, your story, mean question. So uh, another mean question, uh, I've read about this other study, uh, doesn't that completely invalidate your results? Again, completely undermines your, uh, uh, your, um, your research, especially if you haven't read that other study. Maybe it just came out this month and you're not up on the latest um, research. You know, and to say something like this, you know, like, oh, I have a question, I just read about this other study. Um, doesn't it mean that your research is garbage? And, uh, you know, we shouldn't even be here wasting our time. That's basically what this question is. Once again, mean question. This one cuts, again, at the heart of, um, of your research. So some of those are mean. And as I mentioned, your mean questions, one of the things you want to do is be able to identify them. 
right? So identifying the mean questions because then you know how to deal with them. So mean questions, they typically attack your operational definitions. So that's one form of them. How do you know Beck's depression inventory actually measures depression? How do you know your subjects actually read your instructions, right? How do you know you actually split your subjects up into those two categories? So those kinds attack your operational definitions, those decisions you had to make in order to do your particular experiment. And another thing that they can attack is just basic assumptions of science or statistics, right? So how do you know that you can add your, uh, how do you know that you can take your scores and average them? How do you know that they're actually on a uh, interval scale and they're not just on an ordinal scale? So you can't actually take the averages. Exactly. Like, how do you know? I don't know. It's, it's uh, an assumption that you make. And some of these attack those assumptions of science or statistics. So this is the reason why they're mean. Because when you attack your operational definitions, when you attack those basic assumptions of science, right? So that's an important word, assumptions. These are literally things you cannot prove. They're literally things you cannot offer evidence up for. They're assumptions that we have to make in order to do science. Those questions are the ones that attack those assumptions. And they're mean because there's no uh, answer for them, right? There's no definitive way to answer those. So when somebody asks you, oh, what, what statistics test did you run? There's a definitive answer to that. I ran an ANOVA. When somebody asks you, oh, do your results support, you know, so-and-so's theory of, uh, of tolerance? There's a definite answer to that. Yes, it does. Or no, it doesn't. And here's the reasons. How do you know the Beck's depression, uh, Beck's depression inventory actually measures depression? There's no answer. There's no answer for that, right? So, because you do not know. You can say, well, you know, this is the accepted way of measuring depression, right? Psychologists have been using it. Yeah, but how do you know? It measures depression. It's like, well, it's been tested and standardized in certain ways, and and uh, other scientists have looked at it, and they, you know, they concluded that it measures depression. Yeah, but how do you know those scientists are right? How do you know it actually measures depression? This cannot actually be answered. And again, there are scientists, researchers who spend their career working on psychology tests, trying to hone them so that they have a high probability of measuring what they're trying to measure. But again, you cannot prove that they're actually measuring that intangible concept known as depression. Uh, how do you know the subjects read the instructions? You can't. It's a basic assumption of doing an experiment that your subjects will follow, will read and follow your instructions. But again, you don't know that for sure. That's an assumption. Uh, is there a chance that your results would change if more subjects were tested? This is literally asking you to look into the future and try to predict the future. If I could predict whether my results would change if more subjects were tested, I wouldn't need to uh, run subjects. I would just come up with an experiment and I would sit here and I would think, what would 100 subjects do? Ah, oh, perfect. Significant effect, uh, you know, uh, right on my paper. We run subjects because we don't know what's going to happen, right? And, uh, and then this, I read about this other study. Doesn't that completely invalidate your research? Um, number one, no. Nothing could ever completely invalidate your research, right? No one study is ever going to topple everything. It does make your research less likely to be true. It does make what you've established, uh, the theories that you've looked at, less likely to be true. But no one theory or no one paper has ever taken a theory and been like, we just timbered that theory. It's the accumulated result of a number of studies. But again, you might never have heard of this other study. They could bring it out of the blue, right? They might have made it up. They might have been like, oh, yeah, I read about this uh, study. Uh, <laughs> hopefully they wouldn't do that. But this is, this is exactly the, um, the strategy that is used by some politicians. I won't name names, but you'll know who it is. But some politicians, when they talk about other people, right? Remember when somebody always said, you know, oh, I've heard from other people, you know, they're very bad. This, this, this uh, thing is very bad. Or I heard from other people, nobody likes Medicare. You know, other people have said it. Yeah, I heard, I heard about this other study. Uh, it completely invalidates your research. And you're like, well, you know, and this is, this would be a case here where you would just engage in the conversation. And be like, what other study? I'm unfamiliar with that other study. Tell me about that. What did it find? Oh, okay. And you can engage in the conversation. But importantly, 
it's important to try to identify these as mean. Because once you identify it as a mean question, once it attacks one of your operational definitions, once it asks you to predict the future, once it kind of cuts at a basic assumption of science, that frees you up to deal with this following strategy of dealing with these questions. So you definitely don't want to call the person out and say, that's a mean question. You're horrible for asking it, because they are horrible for asking it. But um, you don't want to call them out on that. So what do you want to do? How do you deal with these mean questions? Well, this is a strategy. Number one, this is probably the hardest thing to get comfortable doing. Number one, you want to admit that it's actually a possibility. Right? You want to, because it is. It is a possibility. You want to admit that it's a possibility. So acknowledge the fact that, you know what, you're not crazy, you're not insane, the person asking the question, you're not completely out of left field. Yeah, that's a complete possibility. Step two, you then admit that you cannot know for sure. So yeah, that's a possibility, but we actually can't tell for sure. Science can't determine for sure. There's no way we could know for sure. And then you tell them what you actually did and why you did it. And then you say, you know what, but in my experiment, this is what I did and this is why I did it. And then you bring them back to the results. Because the one thing nobody can uh, argue with is results, right? Maybe how you got to the results, maybe what your results mean, but when you can show them those numbers, that backs up what you're trying to say. So admit that it's a possibility, admit that you cannot know for sure, tell them why you did what you did, and bring them back to the results. So for example, how do you know that Beck's depression, uh, Beck's depression inventory actually measures depression, right? Admit that it's a possibility. Well, it's possible that Beck's depression inventory doesn't actually measure depression. Admit that you cannot know for sure. That's something that a lot of researchers look into and we actually cannot tell for sure whether a survey measures a specific concept. Tell them why you did what you did. But I use Beck's depression inventory because that's the most popular survey, you know, for measuring depression. And then you bring them back to the results. And what we found is that you can see here, group number one had a higher rate of cognitive development. Group number two had a lower rate of cognitive development. So use that strategy. Use that admitting that is possible, saying that you can't tell for sure, telling them why you did what you did, and then bring it back to the results. Always kind of go back to your findings. So how do you know the subjects read the instructions? You can admit that it's a possibility. You know what? It's quite possible that the subjects, some of the subjects didn't read the instructions. And there's really no way for us to know for sure. We are depending upon the subjects' good graces. But what we did was we had the subjects read through these instructions. And as you can see, subjects in group number one over here, they had this result. Subjects in group number two over here, they had this result. So take what you, take these mean questions, and again, just admit that you don't know, admit that you it's impossible to know, and then bring them back to something that you do know. Tell them what you did and why you did it, and then bring it back to the uh, to the results. So is there, a, is there a chance that your results would change if more subjects were tested? And you can say, well, that's a possibility. My results might change if more subjects were tested. I don't know how my results would change if more subjects were tested, but we ran 30 subjects. And according to those 30 subjects, look at group number one over here. We can see that there was this effect. However, compared to group number two over here, group number two was lower. So again, it's that kind of four-step procedure to deal with those uh, kind of questions. Mm -hmm. Isn't that something that what in every single study, couldn't, isn't there a possibility that, you know what I mean, like if there's more subjects that could change in every study, that's yeah. the question you can say that any experiment. Yes, and that's what makes it a mean question. Because you're put on the spot because you kind of feel like you have to answer this. But in reality, it's just true of any, you know, any test. So you'll find that occasionally when people, um, especially um, for, any of, uh, for any of the presenters that are presenting on something that people might have strong opinions of, right? So um, my research typically doesn't fall into that category. Right? So if I tell you that we process metaphors in one way rather than another way, very few people in the audience are going to say to themselves, oh my gosh, that, 
totally up, upheaves my worldview. And I don't know who I am anymore. And what am I going to do? Uh, I can't let this go on, right? That's not going to happen in my research. But if you're researching things on um, uh, certain topics, certain topics that could have a lot of importance for individuals, like research on sexual orientation, like research on uh, gender differences, like research on um, perform uh, cognitive abilities and the elderly, uh, that's oftentimes when they pull out these mean questions because you will present research that says, you know, your identity now and your core beliefs are being attacked by my good science, right? And most people, most scientists should, again, we're dealing with human beings. The idea is that you see evidence counter to your own beliefs and you say to yourself, you know what, let me take that into account. Maybe I got to shift my beliefs, right? That's what we would think rational individuals will do. But remember, you're telling a story. And who are you telling it to? You're telling it to human beings. And those human beings have identities and they have core beliefs. And if you attack those, they will look for any excuse to, to reject what you're saying. So if they already come in with their own opinions, and again, this is usually on certain hot, hot button issues, um, they might come back with you and say, you know what, I don't want to accept what you just said. So, you know, how, wouldn't it change if you ran more subjects? Because I got to hold on to that possibility in my mind, or otherwise, you know, I, I, I'm getting threatened at my ego. So isn't that a possibility? I mean, couldn't everything that you just told me be a lie? And if you ran more subjects, you would actually get to the truth? Yeah, there's a possibility, right? But again, tell them, yeah, you know what? That's a possibility. The story might change if we ran more subjects. There's no way to know for sure which way the subjects are going to go. However, what we did is we ran 30 subjects. And what we found is we found this and we found that. So again, you take it and you say, yeah, you know what? You're, you're coming up with these, uh, this question that cannot be answered. So acknowledge it. Nobody can tell you you have to answer an unanswerable question, right? Nobody can say to you, you know, um, uh, you have to answer how a cat can be black and not black at the same time, right? You, you can't say that you have to answer that. It's an unanswerable question. So if it's an unanswerable question, you identify and you say, you know what? There's no way of knowing this. I don't know. Nobody knows. But this is what I did. And this is what we found. That always brings it back to something concrete. Uh, I've read about this other study. Doesn't that completely uh, invalidate your research? Um, you know, take a look at this and say, you know what? There's a possibility. Yeah, this is the way science works. It moves on. Maybe it did invalidate the theories that my research was based on. Um, but, you know, until we take a look at this, there's really no way to know for sure what exactly the implications are. However, we based it on these theories over here. We based it on these studies over here and look at the results that we found, condition one, condition two. So you can always take those kind of mean questions and just admit, and this is, again, the most difficult part to get comfortable with, is just to admit, I don't know. Right. It's a possibility. Yeah, it could happen. And then just say, you know, that it's a possibility. Say that there's no way of knowing for sure. But this is what we did. This is why we did it. And then, you know, uh, what you actually found. So, for example, I'll give you one from my own research. Um, the uh, um, the choice of metaphorical and literal devices that I use uh, in my research. So I chose three literal devices, ground plane, uh, posture and orientation. I chose two metaphorical devices, um, action lines and multiples. And then I based, you know, all of my uh, metaphorical and uh, uh, picture research around those five pieces of information. Somebody once asked me, um, you know, why uh, it wasn't exactly me, question, but somebody once asked me, you know, why did you choose those five? Couldn't your research have been different if you chose, you know, other metaphors? And, uh, you know, I'm sitting there and I'm like, well, I don't know, right? Could it be different if I chose other metaphors? There are other metaphors out there. Yeah, maybe it could have been different if I chose other metaphors. But the reason I chose my five is because one of the original pieces of research that started this, uh, this field, they chose those five. So the reason I chose five is because I chose the same ones that they chose, cited it, referenced it. I was like, take a look at Corello et al. And then I said, but look, then this is what we found. So will we find something with different metaphors? Maybe, you know, and then, you know, but this is what I actually found. And then don't feel 
uh, don't feel limited in terms of just using the one strategy. You can stack strategies on top of strategies. So I stack that on top of a thank you for your contribution by ending it by saying, but you know what? It would be very interesting to look at additional metaphors like the ones you suggested. That'll probably be something I take a look maybe in my next you know, experiment, next research that I do. So um, yeah, so those are the ways of dealing with mean questions. Yep. What if they like won't shut up and they just keep asking you questions after you? Mm, okay. So if they um, if they won't uh, if they just keep pestering you, either two things will happen. Number one, your moderator will will step in. So occasionally. Um, the moderator, you know, will, and I'll step in just so you guys know if things get out of hand and somebody keeps pestering you in the sessions that we're in, I will step in. In a actual conference, the moderator typically steps in. So it is, um, it has oftentimes occurred, not in a mean way, like a, a very, a, like just, just to kind of put your minds at ease. This rarely happens, right? This rarely is the way that things go down. Um, typically it's nice questions, open exchanges of ideas, but I've had moderators step in when people get overly enthusiastic and basically it's clear they're going to take the entire question period. So if somebody says something like, well, what, you know, why did you choose the metaphors, uh, that you choose, that you chose? And I'm like, oh, we based it on Corello at all. They chose these five metaphors. So in order for our results to be comparable with theirs, you know, we chose the same five metaphors. And then they might jump in with another question and be like, well, you know, uh, what about uh, Blur? You never took a look at Blur. And I'll be like, well, you know, Blur would be very interesting to take a look at, blah, blah, blah. And then as soon as you're done with that question, you know, they might jump in with another one. At that point, the moderator will say something like, well, okay, you know, let's, let's see if there's any other questions out there, you know, because I saw other hands up. Uh, and they'll, they'll go to those other questions. Um, if you find that they're pestering you uh, too much and your moderator isn't stepping in, you can always uh, uh, ask them to, um, you know, to continue this conversation after, you know, the the press after the panel. So you can always say something like, "Well, you know, you bring up a lot of interesting points. I don't think we have the time to get into this right now. So, you know, let's meet after the panel. We can meet to discuss this further, uh, and then, uh, you know, because we have other questions that we need to get to. So you can always do that as well." And then, uh, you know, and then after the panel, when they're like, yeah, I want to grill you over coffee, you can be like, no, I got to go. I got to catch my flight or whatever um, if you really don't want to do it. But like I said, typically it's not very confrontational, right? It rarely ever gets to that point. Um, but uh, you have these strategies in your back pocket if it does kind of get to that point where you're like, oh, my gosh, I don't know the question or that was a mean question or I just don't want to answer that question, you have these strategies to uh, navigate that situation to the point where you can move on to the next uh, person asking a question. Mm -hmm. Are the other judges that are going to be in there just faculty from the psych department or are there other faculty? No, they'll be from uh, multiple departments. Okay. Yeah. So that's another thing to, uh, to remember. Um, your presentations in this conference should be pitched towards a general audience. So because of that, you don't want to use a lot of um, psychology, uh, hardcore psychology terminology. Um, you want to kind of keep it in lay terms. You don't want to assume knowledge. So for example, if I was using the Beck's Depression Inventory, oh, where is it? let's go back here. If I was using the Beck's Depression Inventory, I would let people know that this stands for Beck's Depression Inventory. And I would let them know this is like the leading, you know, survey for uh, for depression. If I was at a conference that dealt with mental illness, I, I'd just be sitting there talking about the BDI, and it'd be like we use the BDI instead of the ZDS, and the BDI has an R of you know 0.9, where the ZDS only has an R of 0.86, and we really needed a high R for our particular, you know, studies. That's fine if you know experts are your audience, but this one is a very general uh, kind of audience where you will have intelligent people, uh, but from a wide variety. So uh, make sure that you kind of pitch it at that level, um, you know, and, and explain the stuff as you go through. Mm -hmm. And do you think organic world is bad? No, okay. no, I've never seen this at the, at the URC. 
And honestly, in the all the conferences that I've ever gone to, these situations have only occurred like twice. And that's amongst the conferences I've presented at and I've attended, right? So like I'm saying, these, thing, these types of confrontations most often do not occur. Most often it's a very uh, friendly environment. And most often you are uh, filled with um, like-minded uh, colleagues, right? Colleagues that kind of have this honor system of, you know what, I'm not going to grill this person because I don't want to be grilled, right? I'm not going to undermine this person's uh, research in front of everybody because I don't want to do that as well. Because you got to remember your audience members are going to be presenters, you know, at another time in, in most conferences. So it typically doesn't happen. Um, and I have, and, and just, you know, for, for your own, um, uh, conduct in the future as well. Um, if you ever are in a presentation and you're looking at the presentation and you're like, oh my gosh, that is a glaring error. This person has, has made a horrible mistake in their design and that just their entire research is garbage, right? Or, or, you know, they based it on this person's research. And I've just read that that person fabricated all their research. Like they literally made it up and this person got kicked out because of fraud and all that kind of stuff. If you ever have that kind of a nuclear bomb uh, in, your, uh, in your mind during a presentation, the, the nice thing to do, I would say the ethical thing to do is don't ask that question, approach that person afterwards and say, you know what, I have this question about your presentation. Uh, you know, can we sit down and talk about it? Because they need to know, right? It would be wrong for you to say, you know what, I'm just going to let this person live in, uh, you know, blissful ignorance and continue on their career. They need to know that. They need to be aware of that contradiction. Um, but they don't need to be destroyed in front of an audience. And honestly, it's been my experience that uh, when I did get some, like, really pressing questions, uh, it's been when people have come up to me after the panel and they've been like, oh, you didn't include any of this person's work. Are you aware of their work? And I was like, no, I'm not aware of their work. He's like, oh, you should really take a look at Vygotsky or you should really take a look at this other individual. They, they saved it, you know, and that's, again, what I'm saying. Most people are going to be like, like you, right? I mean, where does the audience come from? It's going to be other researchers like yourselves. So the same way that you wouldn't want that to done, be done to you, you're not going to want to do it to somebody else. So honestly, you're probably, if I had to predict out of the 13 students that are presenting, uh, let's say that you average three questions per uh, each student. We're looking at 39 total questions. I would predict that 39 out of 39 are going to be those nice questions where they just ask you, oh, you know what, Does, could it work for you know, this situation? Oh, I was just mentioning, I was just watching this TV show where somebody said this. Is that an example of what you were talking about? Um, you know, do you think your results could be applied to, um, you know, this group? Do you think it could be applied to this group? It's going to be those types of questions. That's typically what I found at the URC. But, um, you know, those are the ones where, you know, you can just uh, get rid of that. Oh, you don't have those. Those are the ones where you can just answer those, right? Those are the ones where somebody asks you a question and you're like, oh, yeah, I know the answer to that. And you just kind of engage in this fun back and forth. I'll put, I'll put Laura back out there. He just engaged in this fun back and forth and you're like, oh, that's a great idea. Oh, yeah, this is a great idea. Oh, thank you for answering that. Oh, that's wonderful. You know, let's, uh, you know, that, that's a great idea. So like I said, I'm, I would predict with 99% accuracy, 39 out of your 39 questions for everybody in this group are going to be those nice types of questions. But I want you in there ready. I want you in there armed with the strategies where if it occurs, you got it in your back pocket where somebody says, you know what, let me ask you this mean question. You can be like, no, you won't. And be like, you know what, I'm going to admit, I don't know. I'm going to admit that nobody can know. This is what I did. This is what I found. And what I find, and the reason why I do this is because usually the only thing that separates somebody that reacts like this during a question period to somebody that does not have a good time during the question period. And one of the things that it will help you elevate your presentation to an extremely good presentation 
um, is your, uh, your confidence in standing up there. And one of the things that gives, will give you the most confidence while you're up there is just knowing you're prepared. It's like driving around in a four wheel drive SUV. You might never hit that icy patch, but you know that if you do, you're not going to lose traction. You're going to be good to go. Um, it's the same thing. You, you are probably not going to get any of these kinds of questions that I just prepared you for, but having that knowledge tucked away where you are immune and invulnerable to any sort of questions that come at you, that's going to allow you to just kind of like chill for the rest of the presentation, engage with your audience, not worried in the back of your head about what's going to happen. And that's going to take your presentation from here and it's going to elevate it. And this is why this kind of presentation and these strategies is why I believe that my students have a five out of six year streak of either winning top presentation or honorable mention, not because necessarily their science is consistently amongst the best, but they're telling a story and they're telling it engaged because in the back of their mind, they're not worried about, oh my gosh, if they ask this question, what am I gonna do, what am I gonna do, what am I gonna do? They're saying it with confidence because they're sitting there in the back of their mind going, I'm ready for any questions. Even if I don't know the answer, I know how to deal with those as well. So what can they do, right? They're, they're, you, you, you know you're gonna be involved. Um, so let's say you're towards the end and yep. um, one of the first people finished really early. Um, so there's extra time left in that session. Mm -hmm. Does that get allotted to the next two people or? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, um, if um, if somebody uh, um, ends early, typically what I do is I still go uh, the same amount of time for the remaining people because you never, you, you always want to treat everybody fairly. And if somebody doesn't use all their time, I kind of find like adding that to the last two people kind of short changes the first individual who was left to the 15 minutes. Um, but another thing that you um, that you might come across, and sometimes I do this, and uh, if you have a preference, do let me know because I'm going to be moderating the panel. There's uh, there's two ways to kind of do question sessions uh, during a conference presentation. One is your sort of typical: you got 15 minutes for your presentation, you go 12 minutes, and then there's three minutes for questions. Next person, 15 minutes, 12 minutes, and three minutes for questions. The other way to do it is, and I've done this as well is to do a panel at the end of the, um, at the, end of the uh, presentations. So everybody goes for 48 minutes, and in those last 12 minutes, everybody is sitting up at the front, and you just open it up like a press conference, and people will ask questions of everyone. And it's got its pros and cons. If it's a very related panel, sometimes that gives you a nice little crosstalk thing where people can comment on the same type of question. However, I have found in my um, experience, it tends to be dominated by the last presentation because once again, we're human beings and mostly like we might be saying to ourselves, you know what, I can't remember what they said 30 minutes ago. So sorry, presenter number two, but presenter number four, man, do I have a list of things I remember about your presentation. So I tend to go with the first option, but um, you know, if there is a strong desire amongst the panel uh, to switch to the second one, I'm fine with that as well. All right, any final questions or anything? I think our time's up. We good? All right, so that is that. So um, next class, uh, I think we're going to start talking about how to put your poster together. And then uh, if you need uh, to present next week. So for next week's classes, if you're either not presenting at the URC or if you just want a, want a practice presentation, Send me your emails now. I need to book those times for people. Uh, so send me a message on Canvas, and I'll make sure that you got a time booked. Other than that, we are done for today.